All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome to our webinar on setting up test automation as a business enabler with Accolade Digital and Leapwork. My name is Dasha Naumkina, and I will be um, your moderator for today's session. And I am receiving a pop-up that my system is not stable, and just would like to hear a confirmation from you if you can hear us and see us well, if you can just drop something in the questions tab. I'll just give you a second. I see All right, this up. is a yes then. Noise. All right, <laughs> thank you so much for that. All right, thank you so much. Then in this case, some practicalities. Um, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email after the session with the link to the recording. So you can watch it later again or share it with others on your team. And right now on your screen, you can see our today's speaker. And I'm happy to introduce to you Anand Chandra, Head of Pre-Sales and Strategic Growth in Accolade Digital and Suna Ansi, Chief Evangelist and Leapwork. You can see them on my right and my left. <laughs> All right, uh, just before I hand you over to Anand and Suna, let's have a look on agendas today. So uh, Anand is going to start with short introduction of Accolade Digital, and then talk about test automation as a business enabler, followed by Suna who will uh, talk about benefits of no-code automation with Leapwork, followed by live demo. And at the end, we will hold a Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the questions tab or in the chat that you can see on the right side of the webinar interface. All right, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Anand. Hi, Anand, stage is yours. Thank you so much, Tasha. And we can move to the next slide. So first of all, Welcome everyone for the session and while we go to the subject, I want to take an opportunity to introduce the organization that I represent. I won't take much time, uh, but just to set the stage, uh, in my capacity, um, I had the pre-sales for uh, Ecolite globally. I'm one of the strategic growth leaders and I also look at the m &A part of the business for Ecolite. I've built trading systems all my life. so. Test automation is, is a very, um, you know, it's a love and hate relationship when it comes to an SDLC side of the business. Do you do it before? Do we do it later? So it, it's, it's, we'll touch upon those aspects of tech for tech and tech for business. Before I do that, like I said, I'll introduce Ecolite um, and then we will uh, take the conversation forward. Ecolite Digital, we are a leading uh, next generation digital product engineering firm. 2,500 odd employees. Uh, it's very tricky nowadays to have these slides uh, because the headcount is increasing every hour uh, for us. Um, profitable since inception, 2007. Uh, we are still uh, true to our roots, engineering, high-end engineering, still ingrained into what we do, how we do it. 100 million in revenue give about, very aggressive in terms of growth, in terms of opportunities, very employee-focused firm with delivery centers across major cities in India and in other locations includes London, where I'm based out of, New York, San Francisco, and then uh, Montreal from a Canada perspective. Very recently, we had a strategic investment from New Mountain Capital. It's a leading private equity, which is more focused on engineering side of the business, uh, and then even specifically on that product engineering. And what has allowed Ecolite is to propel the growth is how we are looking at it. From a services viewpoint, uh, product engineering uh, is, is, is a wider gamut, but if you have to break it down into parts, uh, product strategy and experience design, cloud engineering, DevOps, data analytics and AI, and cybersecurity. There are certain central themes on automation and cloud that overlap across the different service gamuts, but these are broadly the services that Acolyte Digital focuses on. From a business domain viewpoint, banking, financial services, and insurance is the coolest business unit. Uh, not that because I'm part of it. It's one of the largest. It, it represents the next generation work that we are doing. And then, of course, healthcare, 
uh, is big telecom uh, and digital media in terms of marketing digital marketing is another big big business unit so those are the business verticals where i collect uh, focuses upon we are very proud we are well known in terms of our association with some of the uh, industry analysts and how we do it what we do it and very proud to have been recognized as a great place to work uh, consistently across the years and that's the most recent certification that we have done so in nutshell next generation digital product engineering largely focused on banking financial services and insurance and then we have a very strong engineering aspect in terms of healthcare and telecom so that's ecolite tasha if you can uh, move to the next slide please thank you like i said the coolest bio the, the coolest uh, uh, gamut and jokes apart from a banking financial services and insurance we point we look at it as financial services and we look at it as insurance if you look at financial services focus it's more on the middle office and back asset back office side of the business prime brokerage wealth management advisory tech uh, some of the new engagements that we are shaping up in the financial services space is in digital payments and some um, some cutting edge work that we are doing for fintech clients of ours and we are building that fintech uh, practice and capability within our organization as well and that is drawing some amazing synergies uh, with our newly signed clients I'm very proud to have them uh, into our remit more focused on equities and fixed income side of the business both otc and listed products uh, uh, when you look at it from a regulatory landscape as well these are some of the products that we specialize in and that translates our business into insurance insurance for us is what we have built for some of our clients is truly ai and analytics based uh, e point of sale claims management one stop shop solution across the different gamuts of the insurance life cycle including product recommender are some of the i would say highlights of what we do in insurance and that summarizes banking financial services and insurance there is a cross cutting aspect of regulatory lens um, and that is cuts across different geographies different scales uh, and we do specialize on certain regulations that we are looking at it uh, specifically around the control domain of the business uh, from our viewpoint so that's a summary of our domain specialism from a bfsi perspective dasha if you go on to the next slide now i i definitely cheated my way in to make an introduction of acolyte uh, and i wanted to set the stage on uh, the topic that we are in today i'll i'll give you a flavor of what we see as some of our engagements uh, during the course of presentation and what this topic encompasses as test automation as business labor when you are building systems uh, when you are building digital ecosystem whether you call it a consumer producer provider association whichever model you look at in the landscape or the stakeholder part of the system there is tech for tech and tech for business our focus today is more on the the automation piece which is more a business enablement as opposed to just getting some funky state of the art next gen technology into the piece but not necessarily aligned to the business part of uh, the uh, the solutioning and i think that is where uh, the today's topic is i would introduce the subject and then uh, sunay my good friend would take a, a a a deeper view in terms of what it is how it is enabled and then also give you guys a demo of how do you structure that up when we look at test automation it's from a business perspective it's important to analyze the criticality of the functions and the features that lies from a business priorities we many times look at it purely purely from a scope of how much percentage of automation we want to do as opposed to what the business coverage or priorities that needs to be automated even when we look at challenges on what we need to solve as an application risk it's largely driven based on a technology choice that we want to make at some times when you look at systems processes failure points end points multi jurisdiction aspects of application risk that is where the key aspect of business enablement somewhat gets 
be prioritized. And that's where test automation needs to have that focus as it moves along. Time to market is always one aspect you would not want to say. Nobody would come to you and say, it's okay for my application to go live when it wants to go live. What is more important is you look at the automation coverage of redundancy of manual tasks. And that's where the word automation takes a bigger meaning, which then translates it back to the process engineering and process re-engineering part of it. And that's where the automation coverage comes in. You don't want to create a test automation strategy or a test automation suit, which is solely focused on automation as, as, as technology deliverable as part of the program. But what you need to look at is, is that covering the priorities of the businesses? And at the same point, has it reduced the redundancy that would otherwise would have been there the way you do it? So while all the APIs, microservices, and cloud aspect comes in, the automation coverage also needs to look at the point of the business challenges that would get solved with the new technology would come. And that's quite prevalent for a very data heavy application. Now, every application is data heavy. I'm not really sure any application that would say I do not interact with data. And what on the other hand is the complexity of data application is becoming even more wide because the regulatory landscape from one jurisdiction, which can be a country, region, or a continent, changes from one side, one sunset to the other sunrise. And in that context, the application remains same, the ecosystem remains same, yet the application tends to behave differently. And that's where data-driven automation, even though it's a practice that has been there for a very long time, I'm not telling you something that none of you know of from the past, but what I'm trying to say is in a hybrid cloud setup, it becomes even more interesting. And that brings it all together, what we call it cloud QA. It's one of the most trending things in 2022. It's about test environment as a code. And that's the true meaning of cloud. You don't want to have a cloud just because you wanted to have a cloud. It actually needs to have a business benefit that is attached to an automation suit. So if I have to summarize it from an application lens that touches upon regulation, culture, scaled automation, these are the six parameters where I would look at it. Now, would you achieve maturity of test automation as a business enabler in a linear fashion or a recurring fashion? Well, the answer is you need to draw somewhere in between your optimization in terms of your environment, standardization, choice, which Sune would touch upon in his conversation. The second aspect is the culture change. You definitely need to focus on scaled automation in terms of people reskilling, entrepreneurship within the team, seed and scale model of deployment and delivery. These are some of the aspects which we like to discuss in the conversation, but when it comes to practices, sometimes we need to take a step back because those don't become a priority, but those are extremely important to change the landscape of test automation as a business enabler. Now, last but not least, how do you then conclude the maturity curve. It is definitely an efficiency. It is definitely a surge in terms of what you would look at as your volume stream. You would develop best practices and you will percolate it across different teams. And that's where new modern technologies and Sune would touch upon, low code, no code technologies, they are there, but you still need to use it in the most effective fashion. The inception point of test automation in a cloud program is extremely important. You just can't say because we are going on cloud, everything would be done over there. So you definitely need to touch upon that. And that is where cloud for the sake of cloud won't work. And that's where uh, you know uh, the element of cloud queue comes in. So I've touched upon a few areas. I just wanted to make a brief introduction of the topic and some of the examples that uh, Acolyte Digital is seen in terms of do I make a choice of a big data technology because I want my businesses to have a much more stronger latency, whereas your volume is not necessarily there, your test automation suddenly becomes more complex. So there are certain choices that we are engaging with our clients, trying to partner with our clients and get a better understanding of choice of technology, choice of people team, seed and scale model, and then allow that layer to 
to scale that enablement of uh, business efficiency that you would get drawn once the application goes live. So with that, I'll take a pause. I'll hand it over to Sune and uh, happy to take any questions now or questions later. Uh, but uh, that's my part. Sune, all yours, mate. Thank you. And thanks for that uh, that interesting introduction to, uh, to Atomite and this hugely interesting domain of uh, QA, especially in the context of all of those associated or rather supported services, uh, which of course uh, QA is enabling one way or the other. And it's a perfect bridge to talking about then the conversation of where we, uh, you know, our joint uh, interest and contribution then lies. Uh, because looking at it from an organizational perspective, from the perspective of the enterprise, uh, what we see today is essentially that organizations, companies are operating uh, more software. Uh, and when I say that, well, operating it, building it, uh, deploying it, maintaining it and so forth and so forth. So the aspects surrounding that, of course, under the umbrella of having, uh, you know, uh, modern companies and organizations today and their processes and their, their market space, if it isn't digital, then I would argue they're an exception uh, in, in, in many of these situations. What that all leads up to is that these organizations are coping with a new, uh, with a new reality, which is driven by the aspect of, of, of building and, and maintaining this software, but certainly also uh, experiencing as that field itself is maturing. And what I'm thinking about here is, of course, um, modern technologies and frameworks coming into both software development, but certainly also maintenance, which uh, summing that up increases velocity severely for these organizations. When I say severely, of course, first and foremost, it's a good thing. It, it enables the organizations to act to navigate, to uh, to pivot faster than they've ever been before, because the uh, the structure which they're working on is is that much more flexible. Um, but of course, there's a bill somewhere to be paid, and certainly when we look at quality for many of these organisations, we see them struggling significantly. Uh, you could say that testing and QA in many organizations is one of the last standing manual strongholds. The the ability to convert. Uh, quality assurance and the associated processes and tasks with that is something that is causing severe challenges for many of the organizations. Many of the customers that we talk to have had their share of experiences and attempts at succeeding with automation. And obviously, it's it's a big challenge for them to succeed with that. And of, uh, this this talk that I'm doing right now is going to I'm going to be addressing that in just a minute. Because let's talk about some of those issues, how they manifest themselves for the organizations, because irrespectively of what we see, about a quarter of all, all IT spend is actually going straight into quality. So it's not as if we're talking about an under-prioritized domain uh, by, by no means, actually. Uh, but there is this built-in or rather very apparent paradox that in spite of that investment into quality, only 50% of all the scope, and this number is coming from the uh, World Quality Report from uh, Society. Um, only 15% of all the uh, the scope to be managed by QA has, has actually been automated, which of course remains then 85% uh, up for grabs, you could say, but certainly now catered for and dealt with uh, manually. If you'd go to the next one, please, Nasha. So that all sums up into these challenges when looking at that picture, when looking at uh, this uh, increase in the drive from software and its impact and relevance and importance for the business processes and the business continuity. When you then have this situation, the, the, the organizations then suffer from, you know, various impacts of that ranging from, you know, um, the, the, uh, the, the hassle, the nuisance of these things, but really we need to look at it from a, uh, from a business criticality perspective. And in many of these uh, organizations case working in a, an increasingly digital market space, which means that obviously their competition, that their the players in their field are, you know, navigating and, and, you know, making themselves oriented towards those same virtues. Needless to say, the ability to act fast, to be able to respond quickly becomes a vital 
uh, if not differentiating capability uh, for these organizations. And when you struggle then with quality, which in, which sort of infers that you, that your productivity, your ability to do things internally as part of supporting your business processes, or for that matter, by pushing out functionalities and features into the market space, when that suffers, um, then obviously you're set behind uh, in that game. Uh, and But aside from that, whatever it is that you've got running already, maintaining that, ensuring that you still have stuff up and running that you're still relevant in the market space uh, from a continuity perspective but certainly also in terms of feature relevance uh, these things all boils together in that melting pot of challenges uh, that we see in the organizations today when they struggle with ensuring a you could say modern and uh, responsive QA process next please Tasha so obviously that takes us to the point of saying that uh, we've gone beyond uh, an elective agenda when we talk about automation within QA. This has been the case, I would argue, uh, for the previous years that it's been sort of a it's been sort of regarded as a nice to have in some organizations that they see themselves making do with with manual test and manual QA. Um, but the image is changing significantly and dramatically for these organizations. They they are simply unable to cope. Uh, and keep up with uh, the desired rate of, of maneuverability, which is set, among other things, by obviously a transformation and a digital agenda. Next, please. So what's the problem then? Well, these organizations working with these established QA organizations, and if you look at the typical QA organization, yes, there, there will certainly be some, some engineering skill sets within uh, modern QA organizations for sure. However, they are being outnumbered certainly uh, by the typical functional testers. So the ones that you would apply to the mix typically, traditionally, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to test and validate uh, whatever features and functionalities that's coming out of your pipeline. Um, so so your, your average functional tester, their contribution of crucial business insight, understanding of the business processes, understanding how the IT applications are supporting processes and the business model, all of those things, which is what the testers brings to the table on a daily basis, that's been challenged, however, by the nature of most uh, code-based uh, test uh, approaches, because of course, that knowledge of business uh, when it meets the wall of, of creating code, uh, well, effectively, then you're creating that bottleneck, you're creating that obstacle uh, to convert that business insight into automation. Next, please. So that was the thing that we set out to try and change. Um, so our, our sort of perspective is that what we're testing, what we're validating in systems is not the individual buttons or knobs or bits and pieces it is processes it is uh, activities that supports and drives business that's that's the thing at the end of the day when you when you complete and wrap up your qa and testing process that's what you're signing off on and saying this is this is working as intended so what we want to do is to take that step and say right if it is indeed the processes that is driving the ambition and the the, the agenda for qa let's by all means make that business approach the language for how you drive automation because in doing so we enable those um, uh, those non-technical users, the functional testers, the, the business analysts, we enable them to partake and to support, and if not, in, in, you know, actually entirely ending up uh, driving the automation agenda within QA, simply because uh, we now take uh, the, the flexibility, the dynamic nature of saying, well, the guy with the knowledge and insights of the job that needs to be done, let's now convert that person into the guy who can also get the job done, which in itself, of course, will uh, promote speed and uh, and uh, dynamic nature and approach to, to the problem to be solved. Next, please. And this visual language that we've applied, we then attach that uh, to uh, all of the technologies and all of the applications that are typically associated with modern enterprises. Typically what we see today, and uh, my friend Anand introduced this great term uh, when we had another of our conversations talking about heritage. Uh, typically we call stuff like this legacy. I'm talking about mainframes. I'm talking about Oracle platforms from past century or whatever it is, and they're still running and they're still supporting business and they're still delivering value. Um, and they're not being replaced immediately for whatever reason that makes sense within each of these organizations. It's part of their heritage. The point is they're there, 
as side by side with latest and greatest from Salesforce or from Amazon or from whoever it is. Uh, these technologies are now working side by side. And from a business perspective, it all boils down to processes. So obviously needless to say, the visual language of LeapWork will accommodate these different technologies, but it will do so from the perspective of the user still working as a process and in doing so, of course, severely reducing the uh, the learning barrier that might be associated from getting started with automation uh, when, when using LeapWork. Right, next one. And this story, uh, having the business resources engaging them directly into automation that resonates very well with our clients because they are all feeling that sort of you know uh, challenge from um, being able to prioritize those technical resources those skilled developers the developer resources which ideally they would rather associate with building new features and functionalities which would immediately uh, contribute to to revenue to the bottom line um, so so Offering them this opportunity to really unlock this domain for their for their functional resources is something, as I say, uh, that resonates very well within these organisations. Right, next please. Oh, that brings us to the uh, to the fun bit, where we get into trying to demonstrate all of that uh, sales talk into then actually what does it do? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take over the screen and uh, share to you uh, my personal desktop here. So let me just get started on that and share with you uh, the uh, a simple demo of, of how to operate uh, the LeapWork automation tool. So this is a demo. I'm going to be a bit quick about it because I'm going to make sure that we have time left to uh, take questions and, and have a conversation, both with you guys. So please feel free to contribute in the chat, in the question fields, and we're more than eager to, to jump into those conversations that you feel are important and relevant in this particular context. While I do this demo, this will take approximately five or six minutes uh, to get you through the, the entire storyline. So what you have here is uh, LeapWorks Studio. This is the user-facing side of the LeapWork automation platform. This is where you go one-stop shop-like to both design and build automation. This is also where you go to maintain it and to orchestrate it. Uh, so setting it up for uh, headless automation, be that in a traditionally scheduled manner or as part of your uh, automated CI, CI, CD uh, DevOps pipelines. We're going to be focusing today uh, here. This is the part of the application. We call it the canvas. And of course, we do that because we like to say that we're drawing automation uh, instead, of, uh, instead of coding it. And uh, talking about that, let's get started. The use case I'm going to be doing, a very simple, but also very representative use case. I'm going to be logging on to something. That's what approximately, I guess, 90% of all tests begin with, is to log on to the given application so that people can get started to work. And that's a good use case then to also tell the story about creating scalable automation, converting a simple functionality in this case into something that everyone can use across the board. And, um, and also talk about another very representative challenge with, with such a use case as logging in, being able to parameterize it, being able to log whoever in. So whatever use and role that needs to be doing a given task, how can you take that same core functionality and obviously make it scale to cater for that as well? We're going to be covering those topics during this short demonstration. Let's get started with building the core engine uh, from which it all happens, which is the login itself. So building automation in LeapWork, it begins here with the start building block. You hover above it, and as you do that, this little connector here appears. We call those connectors, you know, the the, the triggers for for the for the events in that business flow that I'm going to be building, which you saw uh, depicted on the PowerPoint just previously. So clicking and dragging on that connector, you can see we immediately start to draw this business process-like process uh, image of having these boxes connected to each other. And the way that we do that is simply by launching the built-in recorder. So when I do that, LeapWork jumps into the background. And I can then revert to this little uh, widget down here in the bottom to uh, start a browser. That's, of course, the first thing I need to do. By the way, the demo is going to be working on Salesforce. So launching a web browser to get us there, choosing, of course, which browser it is that you want to use. I'm just going to stay with Chrome. And all you need to do then is to type in the URL. And obviously, you need to make be careful with typos. 
hitting start, Leapwork then launches and navigates to the Salesforce website. And notice what happened. It's gone into this sort of capture mode. So uh, as you hover above the elements, these are being highlighted, allowing you to focus visually on the aspect of the use case that you need to work with. In this case, logging in. So I need to work with the username, the password, of course, and the login button itself. So what you do, simply point on the part of the application that you want to work with, click, and choose which action it is that you want to do. In this case, I want to do a simple type, obviously putting in my username. So I'm going to do that, hit apply. It goes straight in. We're ready to continue then with punching in the password. This, of course, being a password, I'm just going to make sure to uh, to treat it as such and again punching in the relevant value on my keyboard here and then we're ready to do the login itself so clicking the login button now you can see leapwork suggesting a different action pre compared to the two previous actions uh, always trying to put the most likely and relevant on top so this is a click it's a left click so i'll do that and then basically just sit back and wait for Salesforce to uh, complete the login. And given that this is a test case, what I want to do now is to assert that the login was actually successful. Given that I fire these credentials at it, I expect a certain user, namely me, to be popping up in Salesforce. This is part of the profile menu here in the corner. So I'll just go ahead and bring that up by clicking on the, uh, the profile picture here. So clicking on that. And then once that menu pops up, I'm going to ask uh, Salesforce to, sorry, Leapwork, uh, to grab hold of this uh, profile name and use that as part of uh, of uh, verification that I'm going to be doing uh, using the uh, the profile name. So getting that, which completes the recording. So I'll return to the Salesforce, the, the Leapwork widget here in the bottom and choose save and close, which takes us back to Leapwork. And now with this completed visual flow, on the screen. And the visual language in Leapwork consists of two components, just very briefly. It's those generic building blocks, as you can see, uh, typing stuff in, clicking on things, uh, fetching values, whatever it is, and then bridging that with the application interface, showing you those components and parts of the applications that you, as a user, are familiar with. So the visual language is really putting those two together and then fully utilizing generic business actions, clicking, typing, finding with familiar faces, you could say, or familiar images from the applications with which, of course, uh, you are entirely familiar. Right, let's cover the two remaining bits of this use case, uh, starting with um, reusability. So, right, I've built this function, which locks us on to, uh, uh, to, to leapwork.com. So how can I convert that into something that I can just reuse again and again? Well, simply, you take uh, the parts of the functionality. So I'm just going to nominate these four building blocks. You could take the entire flow if you would, but just for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to nominate these four building blocks here and right click on any of them and create what we call a subflow. So I'm just going to, uh, here we go, give it a good name like so. So what you'll see is first and foremost that the entire functionality has now been wrapped into one single building block, which of course helps overview. But more importantly, this is now a building block a member of the Leapwork family. So all of the pre-configured building blocks are here, but now also this one. So if I need to insert, insert this function uh, of logging in anywhere, well, simply type ahead here in the building block menu, and I can insert that complete functionality in this flow or in any other flow where I need to do uh, this Salesforce login as part of executing uh, the test case. Now, that was step one. Step two, is then to parameterize uh, the values uh, going into this flow. I'm talking about, of course, the username and password being hard coded into this one. I'm talking about uh, some somewhere or the other dynamically validate the profile name, uh, then logging in. So let's go ahead and sort that out. And it all begins with data. It all begins with working with external data that you somehow inject into the automation run. Just briefly introducing to the most important approaches there. So if you have a database, hook that up. Any ODBC enabled system you have, uh, database that you have available, you can use to drive automation to and from Leapwork. If you have an API of any sort, then you can obviously also use that. Again, bi-directional to use that to apply data to and from uh, your automation. 
or, and this is the one that we're going to be sticking to for this demonstration, uh, obviously also using a simple Excel. There are more methods, but these are by far uh, the most popular ones. So working with the Excel sheet, well, beginning with configuring it to work with a relevant Excel sheet. So this is uh, me simply just pointing at a relevant Excel sheet that you know I coincidentally have available on my machine, on my machine, then click define to visually highlight for the user, all right then, out of a potential very big data source, which one is it then that you wanna use? So just do a selection as you would in Excel itself. Uh, check this one up here, Leakbook then knows that the first row is really the header of the label of the content, and then you can see how the data has been exposed in a very user-friendly and, and, and visual way. And this is how it will look in these other the data sources as well once they're configured correctly. Now, uh, next step is then, of course, to plug in the data source itself to actually apply it in the flow. So what you do is, of course, you insert it in here, make sure that these green arrows, which tells the story of what is being executed and in what sequence. Um, so make sure that it's connected and then applying the data that you need to use. Of course, the username needs to go in here to the login as well as the password, which you're obviously also driving in, still being protected. And then finally, as part of the assertion part of things, once we've gotten that profile name, let's make sure to just check that it passes. So uh, going into the um, fetching that uh, profile name, which is the job of the get building block, then comparing it. So you also have building blocks for more advanced uh, logic-based operations, still accomplishing this without shedding any code, so to speak. So let's work with the profile name that I'm fetching from, from the profile menu, and let's match that up with the uh, profile name coming from, uh, from the data source. And then once we've sorted that out, uh, then we can pass the flow. Now, uh, that's uh, taking us almost to the end of this demonstration. Needless to say, uh, we want to do a short verification if this flow will actually run. Now, let's just have another look at the data source here. And you can actually see that I have uh, my profile name is, is over here. And you can also see that it will not match what we have in, in Salesforce. I'm doing this on purpose, not to just make another happy going flow. I wanna show you a very important aspect of building automation, which of course is to maintain it, which is all about ensuring that once you run the flow, then how can you assert quickly and efficiently whether or not the flow uh, did the expected task or not. So currently, Leapwork is getting ready to run the flow. I expect this flow to fail. The story I want to tell you now is how quickly can you then identify whenever that flow fails, understanding why, where, how, and when. And currently, it's looking for the profile name. And uh, the profile name it's looking for, of course, was sooner as my first name and then just the E, whereas Salesforce, as you can see over here, is showing my full name. So we would expect this flow to, to fail, which indeed it does. But then the question is, and now you have to imagine that this automation is running in the middle of the night. You may have hundreds of flows running. You So if you have like 10 of them failing, now begins that potentially cumbersome process of figuring out, okay, then why did they fail? Was it the automation itself? Was it the, um, was it the application changing? This is what Leapwork helps you with. So first and foremost, you have the full video recording here on the left. You can see as I scrub through it, I can see frame by frame exactly what goes on during uh, automation. You have the detailed event log, which runs side by side with the uh, automated application. So you can see what's Leapwork doing and how's the application responding. Let's take us to that part of the place where it says failed and see, well, what actually happened? Well, let's look at the error message, the compare reports that the found profile name does not match whatever is coming in from the data source. Obviously, we just verified that the, the wrong representation of my surname was coming straight out of the data source. So obviously, the compare failed, and obviously then through that, failing the entire flow. And uh, by looking at this interface, you can see immediately, right, this happened at the very late uh, the very last bit of the, the automation run, you can find exactly which part of the execution that was actually causing the problem. You have visual proof of what actually happened during the application. Yes, it successfully locked me in. It was another aspect of it that failed. And then you have the flow itself up here. Notice the building block that does the compare 
it has that orange highlight to it. Notice what happens to that when I scrub through the video. So any active part of the automation flow is being visually highlighted for you. So you can also track, you know, imagine this was 60 building blocks, your complete uh, uh, create order uh, flow, which will easily have 40, 50, 60 building blocks in it, then understanding dramatically and, and quickly, where did that happen? Well, just go to the failed event, click on the last event, the building block lights up, and that's then where you pay attention to get things sorted. So that's part of that hugely important maintenance agenda. So once flows have been built, keeping them running, which is in fact one of the main driver behind efficient uh, and well-running automation, obviously all boiling down to the total ROI of why bothering with this in the first place. If you can't keep it running, uh, then you end up spending more time on automated QA than you would manually. And with those words, I am going to uh, stop sharing and give the, the floor back to Aran and uh, Dasha. And uh, yeah, let's see what, if any questions popped up. Thank you so much, Sune and Anand. Yeah, in fact, we got uh, questions popping in. And um, I'll start actually the one which earlier, the addressing to Anand. Um, so, Anand, how critical is to set up test automation landscape for multi region deployment from your perspective? <laughs> I think the answer is easy. What Sune just described for the last few minutes is exactly why the criticality is very high. Sune touched upon building blocks. He touched upon parameterization of certain aspects. The application remains same, multi-region deployment. The fabric of the application is same, but the behavior of the application varies based on the external uh, uh, interface that would touch upon. And that's where the building blocks are so important. Configurability of it, maintainability of it. And then when you touch it upon different jurisdiction, whether it's a multi-cloud engagement or it's a hybrid cloud setup. Uh, and I think that's where uh, it's, it's very, very important, very critical that we look at it from that viewpoint. And uh, I think Sunit just described the uh, aspect of why it is important. I think that would be my answer. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Well, in this case, we do have uh, more questions, uh, tool focused, Sona. And one of the questions is actually where and how secure are the credentials and the password? Where are they stored? Uh, they're stored in our database and rest assured they're stored in a secured and crypt, uh, encrypted manner and not in an Excel sheet as you do in the demo. Uh, so, so bear with me on that one. Uh, needless to say, uh, everything is being catered for in, in a sufficiently secured way, which of course is crucial if you take that use case um, when we talk about uh, this data-driven testing and, and validating these features when running, be that hybrid, be that entirely cloud, be it testing different deployments of the same application across different continents, then those core security rules still applies, of course. That's one of the things that is fairly homogenous across uh, legislation and jurisdictions is to make sure that those uh, those those data, which is uh, personal, which is sensitive, that these are kept these are kept in a in a secure and safe manner. So of course we we comply with that. Thank you so much, Sona. And again, another question: Can you secure connect a key store database, key pass, or etc. to maintain the credentials? Yes, we can do that through the APIs of those applications and drive that into the automation flow. So, so that's a yes as well. Great. All right, moving forward, another question. Uh, will the recording also be available in case the automation process or flow was running successfully and not failing? Yes, so Libre stores the recording. Um, by default, it will actually delete it after an hour. Um, in our experience, no one wants to watch the recordings of successful runs. Uh, those tends to be, uh, if not entirely ignored, then close. Uh, but they are available for an hour. And if you want to use them for documentation, you can fetch them through the API and store them outside of the platform. Great. Thank cool. you so much. Uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, and you, dear audience, if you have more questions, please uh, drop them in right now. 
I can pop a question be... to Anan because there's one thing I'm curious about because obviously I know Anan in your company in, in Acolyte you cover and obviously for those of you interested in testing and quality assurance you will recognize that it's a, it's a big domain and there are many many different types of testing and activities uh, related to uh, also life stages of the applications where you don't you know you don't necessarily have for instance a GUI obviously I'm not talking about the applications born entirely without it but you know as part of that cycle of maturing your application from inception to towards completion. Um, so which type of, of automations, which type of capabilities in your experience are the clients looking for across that life cycle? So uh, the capability uh, also requires in the current world, not just the technology side of it, but it also requires a bit of fungibility, right? Uh, when you look at the type of application you touched upon. There are certain applications which are very API heavy. There are certain applications which are very data heavy. So the technology fabric of that aspect of automation is, is, is tightly coupled with the way the application behaves. But then there is an element that steps out of it. So let me give you an example. The way we are now setting up some of the test automations, which are like digital, or we are recommending our clients. Let me rephrase it that way. In some cases, we are successful. In some cases, we are not. Is to have a central approach to test automation. You definitely want to have a people side, a process side, and the technology side. From a process viewpoint, you know how you have a pods of pods or scrum of scrum, but then there is a central layer that sits at the top that gives you the best practices from one aspect of the business or one aspect of a program or an ecosystem to the other. And it is largely represented by cloud architects, DevOps architects, API architects, scrum masters, program directors. QA usually has a very small piece of pie and that's where we are recommending that this is one of the change you need to bring in. And that's where the client is now asking a question back to us saying, what does that capability looks like? Mm -hmm. How would that person would behave and act. Is it a product owner who has taken up a role of a, a quality control person or is it a business analyst who has taken a role of a quality control? Now that individual definitely needs to have more domain association to a problem statement. It cannot be a pure technologist. It has to be a techno-functional. And then the capability also is on seed and scale. You want to build more entrepreneurs within a pod, which you can then take from an existing pod and give it to a new pod. And that's where the synthesis would move from shift left, fail fast, aim low, fail fast structure. And you need to really bring that agile culture into play. So those are some of the capability expectation that the client has. And we are trying to work towards that at Ecolab Digital. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers the question or it does. So, so what I'm hearing you saying is that across that chain of, of very different approaches yeah. to do testing and yeah. in this different stages, yeah. what is first and foremost required is the ability to you know, make those quick assessments and yes. to make those adjustments without having a huge, um, yeah. you know, uh, negative uh, draw on 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 maintenance, yeah. on yeah. the time that it takes to do even simpler changes. You need to be able yeah. to accommodate those things so that you can navigate yeah. as fast here as you would expect yeah. within the chain. You want to avoid discussion to death, if, if I may. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. Excellent. So, so obviously the long story short, but, and certainly from your perspective, catering for the entire life cycle, I'm sure, um, you know, it's not, you know, one tool to rule them all. It's, it's yeah. a, it's a range of applications and, 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 yeah. and it, it, it gets even more interesting when you bring the heritage part of it, something you need to respect, something you need to carry forward with you. Uh, you are very proud of the heritage in many cases. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. It took you to where you are today, right? Yeah. And the, some of the trading systems that has been built, especially the uh, OTC trading aspect of it, in, in BFSI specifically, they are so thick and ingrained into your ecosystem, you can't just plug and play and build them out. So that capability expectation needs to have a respect towards that heritage. Mm. You just can't. Legacy, you can let go of. You can be proud of and let go of one day. Uh, blow up champagne and celebrate the sunset heritage you can't you have to continue to respect it yeah. yeah i agree i agree awesome well that was just a question for me dasha i was curious sorry about that no that's perfect thank you so much well i guess uh, we can conclude this our session on this we are 
exactly almost on time. So uh, I just would like to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your attention. Special thanks to Anand and Akolai Digital for making the session happen. Thank you, Anand. Yeah. Thank you. So we just want to like to, to wish you a great rest of the day. And we give you yeah. back six, seven minutes of your time. That's fabulous in a virtual That's a plus world. as well. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so stay safe, everyone. And it was a pleasure to, uh, to have you with us today on our webinar. So see you next Thank time. Thank you all. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you and bye-bye.